All right, welcome everybody back to the Stick of Joseph, uh, but we have yep. new information, and we appreciate everybody that has uh, made comments. There's been some mean ones in there, but I especially love the what mean do you ones. expect? The mean, the mean I ones don't actually fun. read the mean ones. In fact, I don't really read the comments unless someone points them out to me, mm-hmm. who, I, who I think has my best interests at heart. Um, well, yeah, in addition to new information, because you've had a couple of interesting calls, and I've been on some of them, mm-hmm. um, uh, I want to uh, provide some further explanation. I want to ex- explicate some of the things we said two days ago at length. Yeah, I know, and, and that's the thing is like we don't even need to. We so yesterday, just so you guys know, I so yesterday, just so you guys know, I I talked to both Doctor Jones himself. I had a good conversation. And then uh, I talked to two other Hebrew scholars who don't believe that they're real. Um, and we just barely, you know, got off a call with one who really awesome, cordial dude, uh, v- very knowledgeable as well. And he explained clearly why he believes that they are fraudulent. And then we, ha- we have some other information that we got from that conversation that we'd like to share with you guys. Because at the end of the day, the jury is out. Some people will immediately say... And, and that's a, a majority of the negative comments are these are obvious fakes. Right. And what we're going to show here today is could they be fakes? Possibly. And, for sure. They and, could be fakes. But that doesn't necessarily get rid of their value, as you're going to point out here. Yeah. And uh, they also could not be fakes. The jury is out, I guess yeah. is what we're saying. And the jury is likely to be out for a long time. This mm-hmm. was... Um, uh, look, it, it's easy to remember uh, to forget this, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered in 1947. But the first complete publication of a Dead Sea Scroll is in the late 70s. Okay, these really? things. Really, I didn't yes. know it was that long. And, and there were people who d- denounced the Dead Sea Scrolls as they started Early showing on. up as obvious forgeries. So we're there's going to be a debate and a discussion, um, and it will continue for a while. And and one of the points I want to make and explain why I would uh, partly an explanation of why I was so excited on Wednesday is that actually there's reason to be excited before we don't have to wait for the debate to be settled mm-hmm. there's a reason to be really excited thrilled now. right now by what has happened and wh- what do you mean what do you mean by that let's just let's okay just get into so that we'll right start now. right there so let's so let's talk about the story uh who, who are the known parties here there's there's people who show up in, in saudi arabia with these plates okay mm-hmm. uh the only description that we have of them is that it's an arab right that's yep. that's all we know so probably a muslim but i don't know doesn't mm-hmm. have to be um so we have the let's call these people the sellers okay okay uh, and then we have the we have the buyers, right? Who are uh, the 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 two guys who are being inter- interviewed on the show on Shabbat Night Live? Who again, I think, are owner operators of a Bible Lands uh, tour group. Tour group, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and let me just say right up front, right? Like, I don't want to say anything to denigrate those guys. Uh, no. I, they seem to me like uh, you know people of faith and belief who are willing to. They they had to have known there in, in some sense tying their credibility to the stuff, right? So. For sure. And I, and I will say before we get into this, <clears throat> having talked to Doctor Jones, I didn't ask him if I could share the specific details he he did. So I'm not going to share those. But just my general sense of him is that he is very sincere. He is a good dude, and he also isn't just an immediate drinker of the Kool Aid. He talked about how he's received multiple multiple fraudulent artifacts in the past that he has turned down, and he gave me reasons to believe or why he believes. That that these don't fall in that same camp. And so if, if there is some sort of weirdness going on with these artifacts, it's not coming from Dr. Jones's side. It's probably uh, with the it, seller. It would be, if, it would be the seller. Fraud, so what it so I like. really like Dr. Jones, and it yeah. seems like he's doing a really cool ministry. Um, and I can't remember where he's at, where he's located, but good guy. Yeah. So we have the seller, we have the buyer, and then we have the platform, Shabbat Night Live and Michael Rood. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use I'm gonna use those abbreviated defined terms though. Okay. The seller, the buyer, the platform. This is, so, like a le- this is like a legal document at the beginning. It just shortens the uh, amount from of here on words out, I have you to will use from here. No, this is the company. Here and after <laughs> referred to as. So the seller shows up and they have these documents. And the documents together with the story that the seller tells, like about the, how they're found, okay, mm-hmm. adds up to I think this is kind of eleven points here. Um and and maybe you'll remind me of others that I missed that I wanna that I want to uh, talk about. Talk about. Um, there's a priestly family, ultimately of Jerusalemite origin. Okay, they leave Jerusalem because they're the losers in a political struggle. They flee to Arabia. Indeed, this is normal. This is the, the Arabia is full of these priestly uh, Israelites. Tribes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tribes, families, and and that is that is corroborated. In, in secular academia, that there yeah. are priestly tribes that existed in the Medina area specifically. Right. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So uh, they there is this there's a suspicion that they have um, with them what we would think of as lost books, books of scripture that relate to the Bible but are not in the Bible. The buyer refers specifically to what uh, what they they hope to find a book of Zadok or or um, you know ec- extracts from a book of Zadok. Okay. But books that are not in the Bible. 
these people write their sort of more secular, secular records, secular histories, and their um, legal documents on base cheap metals, okay, lead specifically, uh, but they write their more precious documents on plates of gold, which they bind together with rings into books. Mm -hmm. These, this family is said to have strong Egyptian cultural elements. So we were told, we're, we were shown pictures of two gold books and a lead plate. We're told there are multiple other documents. We're told that there are Egyptian images on some of them, mm -hmm. and specifically Hathor with uh, uh, Horus, uh, or no, Isis with Horus sitting on her lap being suckled, okay, um, which we talked about. That's an image of the king on his throne, the mm -hmm. throne being his mother. Yep. Um, we're told that their language is a mixture of Hebrew and other languages, right? So they use, I can't remember what the languages they said. I didn't, didn't rewatch it. I just wrote this down from memory. Aramean or Elamite yeah. or something, whatever it was. Um, the, uh, they ultimately store their, uh, a bunch of these writings along with other metal artifacts inside a vault built of stone, okay? And, uh, and they are obsessed with the heavenly ascent, Jacob's ladder, the temple, and in particular, the tree of life, which is the menorah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, am I missing any of the, any of the big points off that list that are like really the, the sort of correlations with Lehi's story? That's the point. No, there's other correlations, not necessarily with Lehi's story. Like for example, one that I think is, uh, in Don Bradley's book, you know, you have the circle seal oh, and the then seal. you have, yeah. uh, then you have um, the Hebrew or what are known as crooked characters aligned in columns, which very much looks like this that I have up here on the screen. Um, so there, there's, there's, but yeah, I think that yeah. that summarizes. Okay, all of it. So I got like an eleven point correspondence. Okay, so this is this is the this is the Lehi scenario. Okay, in eleven points of pretty, I think, uh, detailed and specific correspondence, the story that the buyer tells, right, in a combination of the artifacts the buyer presents and what it says about provenance, is in eleven points the Lehi story. Now, one, why would they tell that story? Let, let's assume, okay, two scenarios here. If these documents are genuine, okay, then actual books on gold plates have been found. And, and the story of them being found is the Lehi scenario. Should we be excited about that? Man, we should be excited about that, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Let's assume that the seller are forgers, though, okay? So they, they, they concoct the documents, and they, get to, and, they, and they put together the story, and they go to the buyer, and they tell the Lehi scenario is the story for why you should come up with probably at the end they're going to be asking for hundreds of thousands or, or millions or tens of millions of dollars. I don't, mm -hmm. It sounds like there's lots of documents, so I think they're going to ask for lots of money. Yeah. So, which by the way is normal. This happens all the time, and this is how antiquities are discovered. They're found, they're sold, they get to museums eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, why would you tell that story if you're the seller? Well, the answer is, you can. the only reason you would tell that story is because you expect the buyer to find it plausible. Mm -hmm. You are trying to tell a plausible story of why these artifacts exist, and your plausible story is the 11-point Lehi scenario about priestly families going out in the desert, riding on gold plates, fleeing their political enemies, having Egyptian cultural background, all mm -hmm. that stuff. Now, real quick, I, I do want to point out, the probability that whoever the sellers are, let's say it is a forgery, are thinking, hey, you know what? Have you ever heard of the Latter Day Saints? Let's this obscure little group that doesn't even have missionaries or churches within, you know, a thousand miles of us. We should make something, but then not even try to sell it to them. We'll sell it we'll to sell someone it else that is an evangelical or or is a different type of Christian that probably thinks that they're stupid to prank them. And so, like, I, I think that there's something really clear there. Like, it, obviously, they're not trying to match these eleven things because right. we are the buyers. Right. So this, the Latter Day Saints are the buyers. That's right. It would be a different story if they approached the LDS Church and son. said, "We would like we would <laughs> like to sell this. Send Dallin Oaks out to look at the documents." Yeah. Okay. They didn't. They approached these Christians with this eleven point correspondence with the Lehi story. Now, so a the sellers find it plausible. Do the buyers find it plausible? Yeah. The buyers <laughs> also find it plausible, yeah. right? Because they they find it plausible enough to commit their reputations to they're looking they're still doing research, right? They're doing mm -hmm. metallurgical analyses and other stuff, and maybe you'll talk about some of the things you discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but they believe it's real, right? But th by the way, they go and get on the platform. Does the platform find the story plausible? Why, indeed, the platform also finds the story plausible. Mm -hmm. So listen, if these documents turn out to be forgeries, mm -hmm. this is still wonderful because. 
the 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 seller, the buyer, the platform are all telling us something, which is that the story of Lehi in itself is not a problem. Without them knowing that they're telling that. Right. It is totally a plausible story. In other words, the story that Joseph Smith told in 1829 about this family fleeing the desert and having their own scriptures and all this stuff, totally believable. Mm -hmm. Okay, We should be excited about that, even if these books turn out to be frauds. Because everybody in this story has no problem mm -hmm. with the the Lehigh scenario. Yeah, and I think a, a different way, a way of conceptualizing that to kind of match something that would be, you know, our day to day. If I was to make a fake of U.S. currency, if I were to bring you a three dollar bill or an eight dollar bill, that would be stupid. That would be you're not even going to consider it. Sure. Right. Sure. But if I bring you a five dollar bill, then we have a question to ask. Right. Okay. So we we do know it's at least a five dollar bill. Then you start looking into the different elements of what makes a five dollar bill. What year is it? Right. What sort of iconography is on a five dollar bill? Right. What is a paper made of? So that's right. a question. And and so it seems to me. And we asked this other Hebrew scholar as well. I asked him what sort of if who he does believe it's a, it's a forgery. I said, "What sort of forgery are we talking about here? Are we talking about a three dollar bill forgery, or are we talking about a five dollar bill forgery?" Yep. And he he said, it, "It's not a three dollar bill forgery, so it, it fits within the realm of possible artifacts." Yep. And so I, I I think that that's a really awesome understanding about it. That if these are fake, then it still doesn't negate their importance to a certain degree now obviously if they're if they're real then it's like next level right right but but the way these have been presented and sold tells us that the lehi story in light of what we learned about mm -hmm. ancient arabia and, and the kingdom of judah in the last 195 years is just not a problem mm -hmm. it's totally plausible and we should be excited about that yeah and the, the other point I, I don't know if you did hit this maybe this is when you didn't hit your points is the temple iconography the the focus on the temple which you know is the main thesis of of the book that's going to be coming out in the language of adam um and, and a lot of the work that you've done is that th this is a, a temple that lehi is a temple man who's obsessed with the the iconography and, and visions of the temple this is yeah. So this is so this is why I said, man, uh, if this is a fake, it was a fake directed at me, okay? <laughs> because uh, the iconography, and we saw basically four pages, right, or five mm -hmm. pages, like so it's like three pages right of here, one yeah. document, the front the front page of another, and then the lead plate. I think I think that's all the images we saw. Yeah. But the iconography is consistent, right? It is the tree of life. It is the temple. It is the, the Jacob's ladder. Uh, it's it's palm branches. It's all it's all. Davidic king and temple ascent stuff. And in, in fact, the, the scholar we talked to this morning even said, you know, uh, these forgers, uh, at first he sort of wanted to resist my characterization. I said, man, look, if these, if these are forgers, they're, they're, they're pretty smart. Mm -hmm. and, but then he kind of started to concede it. And it was his example. He said, well, okay, they did, for example, avoid using the Star of David. Right, <laughs> so which would have given it that. away as a forgery because that's mm -hmm. a that's a late symbol, right? Um, but 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 yes, also they don't use uh, they don't have in the pages we have seen you know pictures of sacrificial altars or images of the Ten Commandments or other kinds of images that would that would sort of um, that would well well this is like this is so this is for me kind of point B right so we're shifted here into point B point A. The Lehigh scenario has been validated already. Like, this is already a win for Joseph Smith. Whatever the uh, community ultimately decides about these documents, which may take 30 years unless there's some kind of smoking gun, okay? Um, point B. Uh, there's <sighs> What was happening during the first temple, uh, meaning up to, you know, uh, up to 600 B.C., okay? Like 1,000 to 600 B.C. Mm -hmm. uh, in the kingdom of Judah uh, is, is debated, and if you read kind of the Bible straightforward in a pulpity or Sunday schooly kind of way, mm -hmm. um, you are reading through the lens of the last editors. And what you would think is, okay, you know, the cult all got centralized. The sacrifices were all at uh, Jerusalem. It was, you know, blood sacrifices. Uh, it was, you know, the law of Moses is understood by Deuteronomy. Uh, that may not have been the historical reality, okay? And so it is very interesting to me that the sort of four or five pages of icons we've seen don't show any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It shows a non-mosaic iconography. Mm -hmm. It shows, you know, the fruitful vine. It shows uh, the menorah, which is the tree of life, which is, and, and, and these are apparently, again, the claim is this, is this is an old document held by a priestly family that ultimately had to flee Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very consistent with, the, uh, with two things, okay? A, with the argument, this is a reconstruction, 
okay, the argument that um, that prior to the sort the the this is a scholarly reconstruction, but the Deuteronomists, the sort of uh, the the partisans of uh, King Josiah in particular, who took over and imposed this stern aniconic uh, view of uh, the um, uh, or, or version of, of the religion of Israel. Can I translate for non nerds what okay, you just said? Sure. Yeah. So essentially, th- this group of people who were in power at the time of Lehi—that's who the Deuteronomists were. Yeah, Lehi talks about how he even even that elite, the high, the people in charge in Jerusalem were, had become wicked in his perspective. That's why he leaves. So what what Dave is alluding to is this idea, which isn't just in LDS circles, but there are people uh, like, for example, Margaret Barker, who is a Methodist, who espoused the idea that there was a power struggle around 600 BC. The ones who won. Uh, the power struggle are, are called the Deuteronomists, the bad guys in the Book of Mormon. And a couple things that they do, they de-anthropomorphize God, so they take away God's body. So he doesn't dwell in the temple anymore. His name dwells in the temple. As well as they remove uh, certain things, such as the Nehushtan in the temple, which is the brazen serpent. That gets removed and smashed Shattered, to pieces. Yep. Um, and they also get rid of the the tree of life in the temple, uh, which you know uh, is hypothesized to be be the menorah traditional thought is that the menorah was in the second room in the temple. What uh, Dave is suggesting is that it was originally in the third room in the Holy of Holies and then was brought into the second room after this this group of Deuteronomists took control and Lehi bounces. So, so the A point, right, is that these icons look like the icons of a, a temple priesthood, but not the Deuteronomists, mm-hmm. right? Like these are documents that might have survived because they were kept by a family and they were personal and private and sacred and hidden, and they and they show a sort of non-Deuteronomist kind of uh, set of icons, like non-modern and also non-Deuteronomist. That's the A point. The B point is, look, um, I have a book coming out on May 1st, right? Mm-hmm. This whole thing is exploding at an extremely interesting time for me, because I have a book called In the Language of Adam coming out on May 1st, and and at its fundamental level, one of the things that book is about is how the Nephites are people who are into the pro- the Nephite prophets are a priestly group who are interested in the temple ascent and who obsess about the tree of life. Now, again, we've seen five of these plates, four or five, whatever the number is, mm-hmm. um, but they seem to be the same. Mm-hmm. Obsessing right? over the tree of life. Obsessing There's a menorah the or a tree, tree on every right. single. So, to me, it's super fascinating. Now, if they are, if they again, if they are a fraud, well, man. They look like a fraud designed to me to, to come at me and, and uh, mm-hmm. straight at me, and I'd still pay two hundred bucks for one of those books because <laughs> yeah. it's awesome. Cause okay, it's cool. yeah. Um, if they're a fraud, they still tell us that the story of Lehi is understood by everyone to be totally plausible. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I did not write in the language of Adam uh, on the basis of these plates, right? So if these are a fraud, like in the language of Adam is just not affected. I wrote in right. I wrote in the language of Adam in February. I edited it in March. I heard about these plates on Wednesday, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you know, if anyone's like, "Oh, so if the plates are debunked, you are debunked," no. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you are interested in in like thinking about the Book of Mormon as the record, the sacred record of a group of temple people who ascended in the temple into the presence of the Tree of Life, quite specifically, mm-hmm. it turns out there is a book on the subject mm-hmm. coming out in four weeks. Yeah. No, I, I think I think the timing is very interesting. Now let's let's kind of get into now. I want I want to because there's going to be people that are pulling their hair out and just being like, "Well, address address the the issues that someone could see with this." Sure. And let, let's do that. Let's do it. So to me, you want to talk about the text first? Yeah. Let's talk about provenance first. Okay. Because uh, I think that was the thing that. So I I asked the Hebrew scholar who, uh, once again, he's he's very well um, respected Jewish scholar, and he was like. I said, is this a, a clear characterization of what you are saying? That the biggest issue that you have with this is the provenance. So for those who, I just barely learned this word yesterday. So if you don't know, provenance is essentially, it's like genealogy, mm-hmm. but for an archaeological item. So how, how it came to us. How it came to us. So in a in something that has a really strong provenance, it's a controlled dig where a university is out in the field. They uh, are taking pictures of every process of the dig. They find the item. They take a picture of it. They take pictures all around it, and then they put it in a bag. They send it with someone. They write down who it was sent with, where it got taken, and that's essentially what provenance is. The issue with this is the provenance is um, a story that was told about a construction worker right. that dug into a giant chamber. And they show up in a bag in a hotel. <laughs> yes, and so right. that is an issue, and I, I totally understand that, but I, I asked and, him very straightforward. I said, 
if the provenance was you were out with a Hebrew university doing a dig and you found these, would you... Or not even you. If it was, it, if it was, if it was clearly documented, mm-hmm. uh, well-respected university found this, like, would it be a totally different discussion? And he said, he said, yes, I would be finding reasons why this is legit. And, and then he told us what those reasons would be, which I, I found to be very helpful. So I think for me personally as well, that is the biggest issue with these is how they came about. We just can't know. And I think that's what most critics are going are to point out of the issues. Then um, comes the second issue. And I'll, I'll let you kind of head this part up. Um, because I, you gave me the question to ask him that kind of unlocked this conversation we oh, had with him. Text. But the text. Yeah. When we first started having the conversation, he was like, "I, yeah, these are Hebrew, uh, Paleo-Hebrew words. I'm not seeing anything else. Some of them are hard to read because of lighting and stuff, and it's hard to tell if it's an olive or dollar or whatever, right? I don't, I don't speak Hebrew, so I don't know what those letters are. But um, he's like, but it's gibberish. It doesn't make any sense. These are just random Hebrew letters. And then... Yesterday, you brought up a point, and I asked him, what was that point? Yeah, so well, let's talk about this. So if, if somebody says, hey, this is gibberish, okay, all that that really means, all that that really means is I cannot read the text. Because mm-hmm. if I hand you Mandarin right now, yeah. so, let's, so, let's, so let's, let's, let's pick an example, okay? So here's an example. I have created this example this morning. I have, let me hold this up. Can the camera see this? The camera can probably see this. Uh, bring it back close to your face and I'll Is zoom Is it better in. back here? Yeah, because it will be in focus here. Yep, right there. Okay. Okay. I have written this text, okay? It uses the Roman characters. Hayden Paul, can you read this text? <laughs> yeah, I can. It says, Subuzavum Kazet. Kazeo. Oh, awesome. Have I have I previously showed you this <laughs> text? You're talking. Have I showed you this text before? N- no. What does this text what does it mean? I have no idea. That's very interesting. Is it not written in, Do you know in Roman means? letters? It is Roman letters. It is Roman. Is this and you're a native English speaker, are you not? Hayden yes, Ball? I reckon I, I can tell you what all those letters are. Okay, so but we'll it's co- gibberish. Let's come back to this in a minute. <laughs> so there are several reasons why a person might not be able to read the text. Okay. One is it literally could be a forgery. That's one. Let's say, let's just say sure. That that it could is. be a forgery. Okay. Uh, another another possibility is that their language skills aren't as good as they think. Mm-hmm. Another possibility is that, and and this is one of the things, and that that's the, not the case with this scholar. He's great language skills. Sure, the guy we talked to is terrific. But yes. like, I'm just saying, if random troll out there says it's gibberish, random troll probably can't <laughs> read it for lots of reasons. For that, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, the 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 buyers said, "Hey, there was you know our experts are telling us, and they can't read it, right? They said at one point they don't read Hebrew. That there are multiple languages in here. So one challenge is that you might have to to be able to read it. You might have to know more than just Hebrew. Hebrew, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, another challenge is that it could be uh, it could be a kind of a summary document. And so we actually asked. This is one of the questions we asked the Hebrew scholar this morning. And I said, well, look, what if every one of these letters was actually just meant to remind you of the first letter in a sentence. And so it was a text to just, it was an aid memoir. And it's just, it's just meant to remind you, oh yeah, the first letter here is Dalit and that, that is the word such and such. And it's this paragraph of text. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way to bring back like a memory palace, a way to bring back to your mind a longer complex text. He said, oh yeah, that is a thing in Hebrew tradition. It's called a Simon. Mm -hmm. So one possibility, if someone can't read the text is that it's an extremely abbreviated text meant to be an aid memoir. Now, why might you want to do that? Well, for example, this is hypothetical slash non hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Let's say you needed to have, let's say you would memorize a lengthy, important text, something like the Sermon on the Mount, mm-hmm. and you wanted to have an easy way to remember it without carrying the in whole thing around. In its proper order. In and, its mm-hmm. order, with keywords, right? This is, an, this is an example of a way you might do that, okay? It's called a Simon. Uh, another possibility is that uh, the document could be in a cipher. Okay. What do you mean by cipher? Well, let me tell you about a cipher. I have written this text that I have already shared with you. It is in a cipher. Um, I'm a little disappointed that, that you I couldn't read know. it because that is the name Hayden Paul. <laughs> okay. okay. I even put a dash there to indicate there should be a space, just to be really clear. Yeah, yeah. By the way, ancient languages didn't put spaces, <laughs> so that's you have to, it's harder to read than that. So I made it easy, and Hayden still did not recognize his okay. own name. Now, what cipher is this? Oh, this is probably a cipher where you said you picked a number like twelve, and then you picked a letter that's right. twelve. That's after a substitution it, right? cipher. This is an example of a substitution cipher. This is written in what's called the Atbash cipher. Okay? okay. Now, why did I pick this? Because there are Bible verses that contain it. Really? So it is not so there are existing Hebrew Bible verses. There are existing ciphers. Hebrew. Yeah, let me tell you how it works. First of all, how the Atbash cipher works is <laughs> this is cool. If you want to do it in English, it's it's a substitution cipher. So like it's literally the way Atbash works in English is when you mean A, write Z. Yeah. When you mean okay. B, write Y. Mm. So what you do is you write the alphabet all the way out, 
and then you and write then it backwards, backwards underneath. Okay. So instead of the first, you say the 26. So Atbash comes from Aleph Tav, first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Beit Sheen, second and second to last letters. Okay. Okay. At-bosh. Now, oh. let me let me point out to you a, a pair of verses where this, I think, very likely. Uh, th- this is this is argued, but if you look up Atbash in the in Wikipedia, uh-huh. for example, uh, it will say this. It doesn't mean it's right, but it's interesting. So I'm in the book of Jeremiah. Now, by the way, why is it particularly interesting that Jeremiah might use the cipher? Well, he's exactly of the priestly class of the kingdom of Judah that we're talking about. Yeah. He is exactly of these group of people where the power struggles happen. Where Lehi, where the power struggles, who wrote these documents, right? So this is as close as we can as we can get. Well, I mean, not as close get as we can get, time but period. it's quite close. Mm-hmm. So Jeremiah, two verses in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25, 26. In, wait, sorry. In wh- Jeremiah, Old Testament, 25. Chapter 25 and yeah, 26. Yeah, okay, cool. Verse 26. Yep. Okay. Got it. So uh, it says, um, And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth. Now, uh, here's the last, the last bit. And the king of Sheshach shall drink after them. Okay. Okay. Where is the kingdom of Sheshach? Uh, I don't know. It turns out there's not one. Okay. But if you, apply, if you read it as an Atbash cipher, instead of being Shin Shin Kaf, it's Beit Beit Lamed, which is Babel. It is Babylon, mm. and the king of Babylon will drink after them. Now, why, if you're Jeremiah, why, might you want to put an oracle condemning or threatening the king of Babylon into code? Mm, because they're, they're, you're under their thumb. Because they are at the gates, and yeah. you might not want to admit that you were like... Uh, you Bashing them. Throwing out, yeah, uh, oracles. Now, by the way, Jeremiah 5141... Interesting. Sort of tends to confirm this. So are there are there scholars who like are there scholars that figured this out that, that this yes. is a theory? And again, okay. you can look up the Atbash A T B A S H cipher in Wikipedia and it will it will explain this stuff. Okay. Jeremiah 50, 40, 51, 41 kind of gives us gives away the game. How is Sheshach taken? How is the praise the Sheshach again? Mm-hmm. How is and the praise of the whole earth surprised? How has Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? So why would he use Sheshach and Babylon in the same so that's I think a that's a very good question. I think here maybe he is in fact, and and man, you'd have to go back and dig into like when these were all published and how. Yeah. Who, maybe here he's first? sort of giving you a key if you didn't get the Adbash cipher. Yeah. Like oh, or, yeah. Maybe he wrote the the other parallelism one here tells at, us Sheshach and Babylon are the same. Interesting. Yeah. Where it's it's like the first one was written when he was scared of Babylon. The second one's like I don't. When I don't he care maybe anymore. was not. Yeah. Maybe maybe was not. So yeah. So that okay. So look. So I'm using the Adbash cipher because. We think Jeremiah used it because that's the class of people we're talking about. It is in the Bible. But there are books in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The guy we were ta- talking about this with, with this mm-hmm. morning said, yeah, there are Dead Sea Scrolls There's that are full written. full ciphers in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, and they're fully enciphered, right? So one, re- so one reason a person, even who was great at Hebrew and ha- you know could read the, the paleographic Hebrew script, might still not be able to read it because it could be in code. Yeah. It could be in code. And, and I, I will say this, too. I, I he, he said this, which was interesting. He said, and so if someone presented the cipher Dead Sea Scroll to us without the provenance, we would have thrown it out as gibberish. Yeah. And he said that, which I, I, I like I really appreciated his humility very and candid. his self his self awareness. He doesn't um, want us to name him. He doesn't want us to name <laughs> him. Which I, I would if I was in his position, I would because I, he, he seems like a gem. He he does. He probably scholars. doesn't want to be associated with any of this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. or or with uh, nutty Mormons. Yeah. So <laughs> another possibility is that it could be an amulet. Okay. So we're told by the buyers that there are a bunch of documents we're showing shown three Mm -hmm. right two little gold books one lead plate and the lead plate is much bigger and has a lot of writing on it that's what it looks like to me Mm -hmm. the the amulets the pictures you can see the guy's thumbnail in them they're very small Mm -hmm. so this is why i was thinking is this possibly an aid memoir you're not going to get a whole history on there but you might get like a genealogy by just putting the first name of each person in the genealogical chain right Mm -hmm. or you might get travel instructions by having a memorized uh, you know, s- set of words and and just the first letter of each direction in there, or, or something or like that. Or if there's a ceremony that you're trying to remember, right? Well, if it's on gold, it probably is something sacred or sacred. super important. Something like a genealogy or an ordinance might be recorded that way. Another possibility, and this is the one we said we said, look, if you, if we just if you were there at the dig, this came up, it was found. What would you think it was? And he said, I would think it was an amulet, mm-hmm. meaning maybe it's a magical document. Mm-hmm. Okay. And by the way, the that might the the rest of the document. So the, the buyers talked about there being histories in there and stuff, right? So I, I don't think these are the histories, because look how tiny the documents are, right? And, and when he says magical, for people who don't deal in scholarly circles, when people hear someone talking about a magical document, it's not you saying you think it's magical. What you're saying is that you think that, because, oh, I'll cut that. Um, the scholar, because the scholar that we were talking to, he he had a really 
awesome definition of magic too. Yeah. He said, magic is the other guy's religion. And this is, by the way, <laughs> a, a, this is the definition I give too when I talk at science fiction conventions. That uh-huh. is, cor- that's historically correct. It, it is the other, whatever the other guy's religious um, ceremonies are, right. ordinances, those are magic. Right. And so when you say this is a magic book, you mean it contains sacred information to people that maybe had to do with ceremonies or ordinances. Or was thought to bless you, right? Or like in the same way people mm-hmm. might like put a Bible on their mantle because they feel like that blesses the house. Yeah. Right? It's, you, you might carry a little book. I actually used an example of this on Wednesday. I talked about the Sefer Raziel and people carry little copies of this book mm-hmm. because the book is thought to, you know, bless and protect you. And yeah. so they print little tiny copies. Mm-hmm. Well, look, this is a little tiny gold book. So maybe this is something like a Sefer Raziel, which has a bunch of sacred images, by the way, parenthetical, sacred images, but not the Star of David, not an altar for, for blood sacrifice, mm-hmm. right? Um, not Mount Sinai with thunder on it, not the Ten Commandments, True. but Temple Ascent, Tree of Life, uh, Jacob's Ladder, Davidic King, sacred, mm-hmm. okay? That you carried around maybe to, to, to bless you, to bring good luck, to show your status. Mm-hmm. Which to us in the Western world just seems like that's absolutely ridiculous. But how many of you, maybe not in the LDS crowd, but in the, in the rest of the world, how many of you have special underwear when you watch your favorite team? Or, you know, like that sort of, we say it's like superstition, but Dude, there's a whole, back then it, it, was, it was a part of normal worship. This is a whole other conversation you and I can have someday, but I'm going to tell you this right now, Hayden. Mm-hmm. Magic is not gone. Mm -hmm. I know people who have built their houses in the last five years and the water company to place the well came out with a dowser and found the well. Really? People still do do the stuff now. Uh Um, So (laughs) That's super interesting. Yeah, this is not like far away in another country. This is the water company in Utah, okay? (laughs) So general contractors. So... um, yeah, so it could be, and, and this was his guess. He said, "Look, if I if this if the provenance didn't like make me super suspicious, I would look at it and I would say it's probably an amulet. We should be looking. So, so by the way, wh- why might the text be hard to read on an amulet? Because amulets classically include magic words that that are sort of gibberish to a standard reading." Mm-hmm. Okay, because they're because they're the sacred words from somebody else's religion, mm-hmm. uh, because they're like a, they're thought to be a secret name of a god or a secret name of an angel that protects you, right? So he said, look, that would be the thing I would be guessing. For sure. Yeah. Now, the other piece of the text is he said, uh, look, uh, there, there's, into his reading, there's more than one Hebrew alphabet going on here. There's some letters he can't make them out. Some letters are clearly Paleo-Hebrew. Some appear to be the later so-called square Hebrew letters. We should say appear mm-hmm. because maybe not. Yeah. Right? Um, but he said also, hey, there are plenty of documents that do exactly this, that write keywords in one alphabet. In Paleo-Hebrew. Right. And then, mm-hmm. Which the reason he gave for that, and this it will lead us into the next issue that he had, which you know is, is fair, is he talks about ancient coins. And he talks about how, um, for example, th- there would be uh, Jewish kingdoms. I, I, I can't remember exactly the wording he used, but essentially they would use Paleo-Hebrew on their inscriptions and on their things to show like, hey, we're rooted in like, the patriarchs like we're using these old this old language so they would use it for specific things but not for everything and so then they would they would write everything else in in you know the block letter hebrew or something like that but they would use a paleo hebrew for you know the very important things so yeah this is i i asked him the question i said look from my point of view for all the reasons we just discussed the text is going to remain uh, uh, controversial for as long as the, this may you know as long as this has not been resolved what these are the text is going to remain controversial anyone yeah. who says the text is gibberish has not thought about it hard enough yeah so um the i said if i were trying to prove this was a forgery even if i was like trying to prove it, it's true like i would i would attempt to go disprove it that would be the mm-hmm. effort and, and i'm not doing that one way or the other i have a audiobook to record and other stuff right i have taxes to do but if i were i would look at the icons and i and i would try to see are these icons clearly copied mm-hmm and, and what resulted was a very interesting discussion where he says, well, the icons are a lot of the same icons that are common on certain coins, specifically the menorah. He didn't say Jacob's ladder was. Yeah, no, he didn't say Jacob's ladder. The, was the menorah the and the palm, the palm tree. But even the palm tree one, the example he gave, and, and it, it's probably not all, uh, all inclusive. There's probably more, but the example he gave was a Roman coin. Was a Roman so coin. So it wasn't even a Hebrew. It wasn't even a Hebrew. But coin, also, the right? example he gave was the daughter of Zion crying, weeping under a tree, which like is exactly the image of the goddess of Jerusalem being defeated under her sacred tree. Like yeah. that is exactly. Uh-huh. I was like, okay, I'm not gonna have this conversation right now with now, this guy. But it's cool. Yeah. So mm-hmm. like, but yeah, that's that's we Romans have defeated your your mm-hmm. nation, right? For sure. As personified. So um, yeah. So he, he, his view was yeah the 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 fact that there are a lot of menorahs means I think they're copying off coins, but he didn't have any examples where this is clearly a direct copy. Like this coin got copied to make this right. So. Uh, and Hayden raised the excellent point where he said, well, listen, you know, a person would put 
uh, an icon on a coin for to, to communicate because they value that icon, right? Mm-hmm. Wouldn't they put the icon on a seal for the same reason? The guy said, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it, it, so it is a good question to say, hey, if, if, these, uh, if these images are basically copied, maybe what's got where they're – or or they're inspired from real world images. Mm-hmm. Maybe what they're inspired from is some they've got a few coins or something. Yeah, and that thing, would be the theory. One thing that's important to, to to point out is that it wasn't there were none none of the icons in here, especially the seals, exactly match an existing coin. So that's that's one thing to point out. So at least if it is a forgery, they were sophisticated enough to pull from a bunch of different coins. But even even then, there wasn't. Um, the thing that was interesting is one of the plates had a specific consistency when it came to the menorah when the other plate so you're seeing this one right here it has this menorah that has the, the three steps mm-hmm. now he has his ideas on on what where that comes from he um, said the arch of titus he no, said titus. he said uh, in the in the classic um, Judean pictures of the menorah, and this is true with some of the ones on these plates, they just have a triangle at the bottom, yeah, like that one to the left. Yeah, that a has, has a, tri- a tripod at the bottom, whereas the Arch of Titus has kind of three um, steps. Now, I actually haven't looked up the Arch of Titus since we talked to him to check. Maybe we could do that and throw the image in here. Yeah, if it's look it up. That's on Wikipedia, too. Or just Google Arch of Titus images. You'll see it. And... Um, and he said, and he initially said, so that's a modern image. I said, okay, you say modern, but Arch of Titus is actually Roman. It's like first century CE, right? And, okay, mm-hmm. yes. So there's an interesting question, right? Why they would show, um, why the document would show three steps? And even the Arch of Titus, I mean, look at, yeah, I, you can see it's in three separate. Things, so, so like, so like down, yeah, left, like just down and left, doop, two from the two from the bottom left corner. Oh, here. No, no, go back. Okay. Like there, like there, that bottom left one. That's that's the menorah. Oh, okay. Right there it is. Boom. So even that though only has two. Yeah. So actually, that's not quite right, right? His version. That's super interesting. <laughs> now, now one thing that is interesting on that though, <laughs> Archetitis Menorah. So you do get kind of like the weird uh, tops on them, and it is the circle. Which when you look at, uh, where's the previous? This one. I mean, you don't get the rings along, but you do get the tops that are similar, and it is circle. But. Yeah, so if you were copying, two, uh, if you were copying the Arch of Titus, you would have put two. By the way, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to sound obsessive, right? Yeah. Like y- you pointed out, and I think this is a very interesting reading that three steps beneath the menorah is an interesting indication that the menorah should be in the third part of a three-part mm-hmm. space, space sequence. Yeah. The Arch of Titus there shows it in the second, which mm-hmm. when Titus sacked Rome was where the menorah would have been. Okay. And not maybe, not in the Holy of Holies. So here's another one. One, two. Yeah. One, once again, two. Right. So, so that's those are interestingly consistent huh. because that would be showing Especially where. Especially with the Book of Mormon, right? Where did the Romans drag it from? They dragged it from the second. Yeah, because if you're room. copying the Arch of Titus, I mean, you're you doing don't put two. three, you put two. So, uh, huh? We'll so, have to send this so to this him is this is the question. This, the, these are all the questions, right? The, and I think the bottom line, which he he said, look, if the if the provenance didn't feel really shifty. I would be, I would, I'd provisionally accept it, and I'd be trying to figure out, you know, how to make sense of it. How to make sense of it? Why does it have two different, you know, alphabets? Mm-hmm. Um, it, because the provenance is uh, uh, shifty, I therefore feel like um, I'm paraphrasing him, but like the bar is high. It's got a lot to prove, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's entirely understandable and reasonable. What one more point he made? So this specifically, uh, he was saying, hey, I think that um, the letters here oh, have been boy. copied from a coin from the Bar Kokhba revolt. So those two yeah, so uh, letters at the top up. are Shin Mem. So uh, as a word, they make they make the um, it's very Bar Kokhba uh, B A R space C O C H B A means or or yeah, that works Bar Kokhba. So um, Bar Kokhba means son of the star, uh, and it was a messianic revolt, I want to say 125 AD or something. Like, as I'm saying this, you're looking it up on Wikipedia and mm-hmm. checking me uh, back home. But uh, he says they put Sheen Mem uh, on the Bar Kokhba. So he briefly established a kingdom, uh, coined some coins, uh, and then was overthrown by the Romans. Are we sure it's the Bar Kokhba that had? Oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, there it is, Sheen Mem. So now, to me, those, oh, yeah, so it's the same thing, but it's sideways. Uh-huh, it's sideways. Right? Yep. So you can see how those, in fact, are the same letters. So he said, look, this looks to me like, um, their the seal is someone basically copying from and elaborating from a Bar Kokhba era coin, and in the Bar Kokhba coins, what they uh, what those letters stand for is the first two letters of the king's first name, which is Simeon. So Shin Mem, mm-hmm. uh, Shim On. Okay, mm-hmm. and uh, because there's not enough space on the tiny coin to write out the so whole name. So this is Shin and then Mem and Mem. Correct. Okay. So uh, and he, and whereas uh, the the buyer has uh, is reading that as Shem. As a uh, a substitute for God, you don't say the name of God. You say Hashem, the name. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. And he said, look, it could be. I don't think so. Right. Mm-hmm. So so this is this is the space we're in, right? Is that yeah. is that um, from his point of view, could be real because it the because of sort of the dodgy story about where it came from, uh-huh. uh, he wants sort of a lot more proof before he yeah. would come so out these, and say, yeah. Bar Kopfa, one thing I will say about these coins, none of them show menorah on the Bar Kopfa, right? So that, that means they're gonna they, they would be taking multiple coins, they would have to be and That's, like mixing them up. So there's no menorah on the Bar Kopfa stuff, but there is the the Shem, whatever, and there's the front of the temple, right? The Shin Mem. That's yeah, but even then, there's two pillars on each side. There, right. there, are, there aren't any two pillars. There's only there. There are two pillars. This is four this pillars. This is four pillars, right? Um, right. Maybe it could be a palace. And then I, I, that's what I. I didn't even think about the temple when I saw this. But that right. said, I'm not. You know, I'm not no expert. One thing that is interesting to point out is there is this branch, which there is a branch motif that shows up. Um, well, and there's a cluster of grapes on the left, right? But but again, Bar Kokhba, son of is the this star. This a cluster of grapes. Is that what it's supposed to be? Well, I could be wrong. I saw but, ram. Oh, I, I don't even know rams. I, I would have thought cluster of grapes, um, but he he was seen in messianic terms, and people who opposed him yeah, called him Bar Kokhba, son of the deceiver, mm-hmm. uh, and his and his uh, supporters called him Bar Kokhba, son of the star, as a reference to the prophecy of Balaam in the book of Numbers twenty five. A star shall arrive arise out of Judah, mm-hmm. which his his people understood as being. A reference to him. I think his name is actually a third thing. I can't remember what his, his actual name How is. How is this stuff just in your head that you're just winging out, bro? This is insane. I'm I'm old. <laughs> you're a freak. I am old. You're a freak of nature. Um, so it's amazing. Um, y- yeah. So uh, so look. What is? I don't know that we're wrapping up, but like like what do I think about this? I still think uh, I I am more. I think it's more likely than not that they are ancient. Mm-hmm. Uh, we haven't seen all the books. These could even just be amulets that are part of the find, mm-hmm. and like the other books have other stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, they described Egyptian images, which we didn't see. Um, they described histories. We did not see documents long enough to write histories, right? Mm-hmm. So what they are describing and what they are showing are different. Um, so, uh, look, I, my inclination is I think there's reason to be optimistic this stuff is real. It's real. And to go back to the first point, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. because these people have told us that the Lehigh scenario is totally plausible. And we should be, we're For not sure. going to, we're not going to, this controversy, unless there's a smoking gun, like mm-hmm. a guy comes out and says, aha, I made these up. Mm-hmm. Unless that happens, this is going to be a controversy that's going to go on for for years. There are yeah. books that were thought to be forgeries for even centuries that were ultimately vindicated. Okay. And, uh, uh, it's your grandkids who may hear an answer to this. You don't need to wait for the answer. What we know now is that the story that Lehi tells is totally consistent with the history of Arabia and the Kingdom of Judah as we now understand it. Mm-hmm. That's the awesome thing here. Yeah, I think it's I think it's super interesting. And I one one more to say, like calling it a golden book. I think that's what really messes this up because I don't even know. This might only be two leaves. You know what I mean? There might be a front, middle middle and then on the back I, like, I doubt there's more than 10 or something in that book yeah i mean it's pretty tiny i don't know like you're not like it, it, it looks like there might be one other behind it well there is the one because it has the date palm leaf right but it might only yeah, be three leaves but i only be three leaves so when you call this a book it's like a. I think that that sets a certain expectation that oh the writing in a book should look this way yeah there shouldn't be so much iconography in a book yeah but if you switch that, you make that change. Oh, this is an amulet, or this is an o- ode memoir, uh, an aid a- memoir. Aid it's just memoir. a little memory aid. It's like it's like when you went to I don't know if you guys maybe I'm too old here, but like when I went to seminary, they gave mm-hmm. you a little plastic laminated half sheet that had like the scripture oh, master yeah, scriptures yeah. on one side and like a timeline of the Nephite civilization mm-hmm. on the other side, right? Yeah, it's that. Mm-hmm. It's not meant to be a whole book. It's meant to be a little bit of key information for you to learn yeah. or carry around with. Or you. even I think with scripture mastery because we used to like memorize scriptures, right? And you mm-hmm. like get, get them passed off and um, I'm pretty pretty sure that there was you, you had two different sheets one was the whole verse and mm-hmm. then the other one was just the first letters oh, of the verse as well that helped you as you continue to learn it was an aid so so that's the thing is now now take this as a as a possibility let's say that this is real this is a book that contains temple things and potentially temple uh, words inside of it that someone who leaves Jerusalem and and f- flees somewhere else holds on to and is passed down as something sacred uh, to to preserve the memory of sacred things and it's not a book it's meant to be carried with you and that's it you know and I, I think that that's, sure. that's somewhat problem so it I, shows your status mm-hmm. I am of a priestly family I carry this book this room it's like a CTR ring too it reminds it's me of who of, yeah. I am mm-hmm. and I can show it to other people I belong in the club and yeah. it's got a key prayer just in highlighted letters and Jews do this stuff now like when I was in when I was in they, they, 
like when I was in Israel, for example, on the outside of our uh, on the outside of our door, what's what's hanging on the wall? Yeah, the right manusa there? or the, the or manusa. the phylactery. This could be kind of something like the equivalent of a phylactery. Yeah, you wear it, you wear it on you, and it reminds yeah. you of these things. Yeah. It's not like every single time they touch that. As right. they walk into the door, they're reading it or right. whatever. Or it's not like when they tie the box to their head or to their arm that it's there so they can read everything in it. It's a symbol of things that they know already. You know right. what I mean? It's meant to remind. These are people. Look, if we're talking about 600 BC or even like, you know, zero, mm-hmm. um, we're talking about mostly illiterate, largely oral cultures. And there's a lot of evidence that people would memorize much more than we're. Well, then you and I are used to memorizing, but way more than the new generations are used to memorizing. Because mm-hmm. now people think that everything's in their phone. Yeah. So they memorize nothing. No. Right? My um, grandpa had like 60 poems memorized, because that's what he would get paid when he would memorize poems when he was a kid. When I went backpacking with my dad, he would buy us a milkshake on the way home uh, at Granny's up in Heber. So look, if you're in Heber, Utah, go to Granny's. I, I think I've been there. Mil- best yeah, milkshake yeah. in the state. Iceberg also very good. Granny's the best. And uh, But only if we memorized the scripture that he brought with us. And mm-hmm. it was not a verse. It was a chapter. So we'd like memorize Isaiah 11 or like the <laughs> last makes so much the sense. last 14 verses of section 121. <laughs> yeah, that's probably right. Dude, that's amazing. So, well this is a th- so so look, I need to do that. we are using our memories less and less and less. So people may have had large bodies of information committed to memory that this just helped remember the, remind them of the highlights. the highlights. It could also be like astronomical or astrological information, mm-hmm. right? I mean, some of these images could be reminding uh, the the holder of constellations mm-hmm. or configurations of things in the you stars. You do have the star, the star imagery, and he, he did point out that the star imagery is also found on some coins. But once again, the coin argument, like I get it from if you know something's a forgery and you're asking right. where did exa- they get these icons exactly from. If it exactly matched a coin, I'd be like, that's a smoking like, bullet. It yes. doesn't exactly match any coins. It doesn't match any coins, plus it doesn't match the the thing of Titus, the, right, which is it interesting. I want to get his, like, it, go the back forger and say, just, so, and, and that's where I come down to. The forger this, had read Dave Butler and said, no, it's in the third room. Yeah, the third room. <laughs> or this is the thing that's really interesting that I, I see is. Huh. And, and I see this with arguments against the Book of Mormon as well. Joseph Smith had to be smart enough to be able to go this far, but he had to be dumb enough to do it wrong in this way. Yeah, that's and interesting. And so there, there's this weird balance where the, the person had to be smart enough to grab things from that time period and not connect them together. With a consistent iconography, not not inadvertently using mm-hmm. real common icons now like the Star of David. Uh-huh. But then be stupid enough to have three platforms instead of two. Right. So it's like... And that's the problem I see with Joseph Smith. Is he smart or is he stupid? Is he is he careful or is he sloppy? And and that's the issue that we have with these. Yep. Um, that said, it's really hard with this when we don't have it in our hands and we aren't able to assess where it came from. If they could take us back to the spot, you know, right. where where this hat, where they found these, right. then you could maybe find some organic material in there, and carbon date 14 it. date it. And Although then, the problem is at this point, people would who didn't want to believe would still say, okay, yeah, was that it though? Because it was uncontrolled when you found it. Mm-hmm. Did they add this in later? This is the story this about the Dead Sea Scrolls too, which was found by a shepherd boy mm-hmm. whose name, I forget what it is in Arabic, but his name is the wolf. Yeah. And he was so chasing cool. a stray goat and threw a rock and it fell into a cave and he heard like a chink of something breaking. Mm-hmm. breaking. He goes down and it's a bunch of pots. It sounds fake out of a movie. Like if right. someone came to you and said, yeah, Yes, the shepherd boy threw a pot and he found this pot and then he found a scroll of Isaiah from the first right. century right. or from 200 BC. Isn't that right. the oldest Isaiah scroll? I think that's, that's right, the great yeah. scroll. Yeah, 200 BC, then you'd be like, that is an obvious fake. Right, or or the non commodity texts, which were like buried in bat guano, and when we were dug up, they're like confiscated by the local strongman and the sheriff, and there's all, there's all these like kind of criminal dramas about how they came uh-huh. to light. And so people didn't all they didn't all accept them. They 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 thought they said. Because of the provenance, I find this all sketchy. Now, Mm -hmm. eventually, what was on them has led people to say, yeah, all of those are... I I think you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who says the Dead Sea Scrolls are bogus now. You will find Mm -hmm. someone. So if you could break the cipher of this, if this is a cipher or this is uh, an uh, aide de memoir, then... And you were able to solve that. And you were able to say, all of these letters correlate to this verse in Isaiah or this verse in this. Then people would be like, okay, I have, I, I find it hard to believe that an a- a Arabic forger is putting Isaiah 11-2 right. in there or something or whatever. Right. You know? right. So at the end of the day, guys, I hope you see that there's a reason to stay curious and hungry. Ask the questions. Don't discount everything immediately. Don't accept everything immediately because the Lord is going to give us things and it's it's prophesied in scripture that he will continue to give us things to teach us and and to lead us to towards the second coming. So let's be wise, but let's have soft hearts and open minds. Until next time, stay curious and hungry.